How lovely, I can tell you're a lovely audience already. Uh, very warm welcome uh, to you all. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah. We are going to be debating a motion tonight, um, hoping it's going to be very lively, uh, even without our two MPs, but they are going to come. Um, the motion is, the left has right on its side. Politics, there's an awful lot of it about, isn't there? Now, what side you're on, on the political spectrum, tells us a great deal about your vision for society, how you think society ought to be. But are you willing to have your mind changed? Let's see if that happens today. You've already voted on the motion as you came in. Shortly, we're going to be hearing the opening speeches of our speakers. And then I'm going to announce the result of that first vote. We'll be taking questions from you and encouraging some lively debate, I hope, between the speakers. The speakers will then close their debate with a short summing up, and then we'll have the final vote. And you will have one of those. And how you vote, there'll be ushers running around uh, at the point at which you are going to be voting. And just tear the slip on that you want to vote with and put it into the box. And if you still haven't made up your mind, don't tear anything and put the whole slip in. Um, now, if you're on the left, you t do you believe that people who share your worldview are the ones who have society's best interests at heart? That your perspective, your compassion for those who are weaker, less robust members of society are better protected by your vision and your view of the world? Is it the left that only that will fight for sexual, racial equality, for the rights of workers? Is it you on the left who think that your view of the world will ultimately make it a better place for the largest numbers possible? But if you identify yourself as a person on the right, do you feel that at the heart of the view that I've just outlined very briefly, there is hypocrisy? That just because you say that you care, that you have more compassion? Uh, that it makes you right because you display your compassion. The left, according to some on the right, many on the right, feel that in fact that view is damaging to the state, that expanding the state and intervening to help those people who are less robust can in fact be counterproductive and therefore allowing those people who might be instinctively individual and want to use their entrepreneurial spirit to better themselves are actually being stifled in some way. I'm going to introduce our opening speaker, George Monbiot, columnist for The Guardian, known, of course, for his political and environmental activism. He has uh, several best-selling books uh, to his name, Captive State, The Corporate Takeover of Britain, and most recently, Out of the Wreckage, A New Politics for an Age of Crisis. George is going to be speaking for the motion. Thank you all. Thanks very much, Rezia. Um, I have to confess before I begin that the left sometimes drive me round the bend. The meetings, the uh, factions, the um, endless splitting. Um, it's true to say, unfortunately, that the old adage often holds up that um, the right seeks converts and the left seeks traitors, and there will be a public guillotining of opposing factions at the end of this debate. But for all that, I am on the left. I belong to the left, and I will remain on the left because the left is the only solution to a predicament that faces every generation. And this predicament is the escalating concentration of wealth and power. This happens not because people are wicked, though there are one or two. It is an innate and intrinsic characteristic of all complex societies, going all the way back to the first cities in Mesopotamia, 6,000 or more years ago. And it happens, well, perhaps a good way of explaining how and why this happens is through the concept that Thomas Piketty has popularized of patrimonial capital. What he shows, very convincingly in my view, is that when the rate of return to capital exceeds the rate of growth of economic output, then necessarily, inevitably, 
inequality spirals, social mobility stalls, and an enterprise society gives way to a rentier society. Now, to put this um, in more comprehensible terms, if you have a lot of money and property, you can use that money and property to extract more money and property from the rest of society in the form of economic rent. Now, I define economic rent as being the excessive charges that you can impose on people for the use of non-reproducible resources over which you have exclusive control. A good example is the ridiculous cost of rail tickets, which we have to pay because the rail companies have us over a barrel. So they can charge us way above what the rate ought to be because we have no choice but to use their service if we want to travel from one place to another. That's an example of economic rent. Now, the accumulation of this wealth and power that arises from those returns to capital, this, this is something with no natural limit. There's no point at which it stops itself, except sometimes through economic collapse. But if there is no political opposition to that accumulation, it grows and grows until, as we've seen in at several periods of history, a very small number of people manage to capture just about all the production of society. And sometimes the result of that is that the destitution and debt and unemployment that that tremendous capture of social wealth causes will then lead to that economic implosion of the kind that we saw, for instance, with the Great Depression. Now, it doesn't end there, because once you've managed to capture a great deal of economic power, you can use that economic power to capture political power. And everywhere where we see that sort of unalloyed growth of um, tremendous economic concentration, we see a concentration of political power going alongside it. Democracy becomes more or less a dead letter. Um, the whole concept of a popular government is undermined, and we end up with government of the elite, by the elite, for the elite. Does this sound at all familiar to anyone? It's, it's a sort of inexorable development of not having sufficient opposition to that vicious cycle of growing concentration of wealth and power. Let me give you an example of how this operates. If we look back to the second half of the 19th century, um, and we can take the example of one form of economic rent, which is the excessive fees that you must pay to rent a place to live. And an extreme example was the old Nicol, which was a slum that developed in the second half of the 19th century around Bethnal Green. There were people living in that slum um, who occupied a single room, a whole family occupying a single room in a cellar five foot high with no natural light. There were hundreds of people living in those conditions and thousands living in conditions which were scarcely better. The rate of infant mortality was roughly twice that of society as a whole because most of those families could only afford one bed and the whole family slept in one bed and one of the causes of that mortality was that people would roll over in the night and suffocate the babies. The rooms were infested with damp, with rats, with lice, with fleas, with rotting walls, with collapsing ceilings, because the people who owned these buildings invested nothing at all in repairing them. They didn't need to. People had no choice but to live there and to pay. And yet, despite those conditions, people in the old Nicol were paying per cubic foot four times as much as tenants of the poshest houses in the West End. Why were they paying these extraordinary fees for these disgusting conditions? Well, because they had no power. Whereas the landlord's power over them was almost absolute. In order to try to raise that money, those people in the old Nicol worked every hour that they could, every waking hour, basically. They were working in their own rooms, 
in often appalling conditions, doing piecework, being paid very little for it, such that for the inhabitants of the old nickel, the name they gave it was the sweater's hell. But the people who harvested this money, these extraordinary rents that the people were paying, they didn't have to work at all. These people included MPs, peers of the realm, senior churchmen. Some of them became amongst the richest people in the country. They didn't even have to collect the rents. They sent their agents to do that, often with great brutality. And that process basically inexorably led to the accumulation and accumulation of wealth until we saw its explosion, the explosion of the whole system later in, in the early 20th century with the Great Depression. So who's going to stop that from happening? Well, not the right, because the right basically exists to protect patrimonial capital. That is what it's there for. Whereas the left, when it remembers what it's for, exists to try to break the power of patrimonial capital and to break that vicious cycle of accumulation on the one side and deprivation on the other. Now, I know that the days of the old nickel have, for the time being, passed, but let's see roughly where we're placed on this index. I wonder if you could help me with this. That, um, could anyone who rents please put their hands up? Thank you. Could you keep your hand? Oh, sorry, keep your hands up for now. But could you put your hands down if you pay less than 25% of your income in rent? So in other words, if you pay 25% or more, keep your hands up. 40% or more? Anyone here pay 50%? One or two. Now, in 1885, in response to the old Nicol scandal and others, the Royal Commission on the um, Housing of the Working Classes reported that there were several, well, quite a few, almost half the people in the working class were paying 25% or more of their income in rent. Today, we find ourselves back in a similar position. We haven't yet descended to the conditions of the old Nicol, Principally, I believe, because we're still enjoying the legacy of the social democratic era, a period when the left managed to get a foothold in British politics. That's a legacy which is gradually fading. It sort of more or less came to an end, that era, about 40 years ago. But we still, I believe, benefit from it. And at times, the left was highly effective at breaking the vicious cycle that I'm talking about. So, for example, in um, the 1940s, when um, the left was perhaps at the height of its power, in the United States, the top rates of income tax rose to 94%. In the United Kingdom, to 98%. And economists look back to that period and say, well, that was completely irrational, because the Laffer curve shows that beyond about 70%, you get no greater revenue back from your income tax. But they're missing the point of it. Because those very high rates of tax were not just to raise revenue, they were to break the power of patrimonial capital. And they did so with great effect, such that, for the first time in history, working class people in this country had decent housing, often in the form of housing provided by the state, council housing. We got the NHS. Uh, we got very high employment with a widespread distribution of prosperity and well-being. We got a robust social safety net which prevented anyone from falling to the condition of people in the old nickel in the previous century. These were astonishing achievements, but they could only be brought about through breaking that vicious cycle and redistributing wealth. Unfortunately, um, when Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan came to power, they began to reverse a lot of that. They brought the top rates of tax right down, and they laid waste to public protections, to regulations intended to defend people from predatory behavior. And amongst those regulations were rent controls. And so the vicious circle began to turn again. And Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, you know, there were 13 years of Labour politics here, but they didn't really grasp 
the importance of that power of patrimonial capital and the importance of trying to contain it. So even through those years, that inequality and that escalation of the concentration of wealth and power continued to develop and has continued since. So who is going to break this? Who's going to break the circle? Who's going to ensure that we don't end up with a tiny number of people taking the majority of social wealth into their own hands? I mean, it's happening already. Um, Piketty and Sayers showed um, that in the first um, uh, term of Obama's, uh, uh, Obama's first term in office, um, the 1% took 94% of all the economic growth in those first four years. 94% of it went into the hands of the 1%. This is, very, this is very close to approaching the point at which a tiny faction manages to capture the whole production of society. And that's a very dangerous point indeed, not just for people on the losing end of that, but for the whole social and economic structure, which then is pushed gradually towards collapse. We've seen rumbles of that with the 2008 financial crisis, but I suggest we've seen, nothing, we've, seen, we've seen nothing so far by comparison to what it could become. So who is going to break this? Is Theresa May going to break the vicious cycle? I don't think so. Is the Conservative Party going to break the, British, the vicious cycle? I don't think so. It exists effectively to sustain it, to protect and insulate the winners of that process from challenge. Only the left can do it. Only the left has ever done it. Only the left, for all its manifest and manifold faults, many of which I will probably have to admit tonight, will, will continue to do it. And only when we have a real left, which really recognizes its role as breaking that cycle, will we see this very dangerous trend going into reverse. So, my friends, I urge you, please, to support the motion that, though it's not always right, no one ever is, by and large, broadly speaking, the left has right on its side. Thank you. Thank you, George Monbiot, our first speaker for the motion. Our first speaker against the motion is Roger Scruton. He has published more than 40 books on philosophy, aesthetics and politics, including How to Be a Conservative and Fools, Frauds and Firebrands, Thinkers of the New Left. He is Britain's leading philosopher of conservative thought, but by his own admission, he says there isn't much competition. <laughs> Roger Scruton, please, against the motion. <clears throat> thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you, George, for that very powerful uh, and rhetorical presentation of the left-wing case as it was in 1865 or thereabouts. <laughs> <laughs> but, <clears throat> My own feeling about this is that, of course, we all, in the end, depend upon some story of our history in order to bolster up our present attitudes, and the left has been very good at creating a kind of mythopaic history of our country, which leaves out of consideration all the things that particularly appeal to me. My father's family rose from the slums in Manchester, not through the help of the socialist state, but because my grandmother had a mortgage with the building society, the local friendly society, which was founded, in fact, 100 years before by the working class people of Manchester in order to offer each other mutual aid. That was one of the ways in which people advanced in, that, in our society in those times. Uh, they had difficulties with health, but they already enjoyed, uh, before the National Health Service, the kind of uh, treatment that made it possible to survive the epidemics of tuberculosis and so on uh, that existed uh, inevitably 
because of the sanitary conditions of the new, newly built cities. And that was made possible by the British Medical Association, which was a voluntary association of doctors beginning in 1834 uh, and the network of hospitals that they founded. That network, of course, made it possible for the national health to exist, but it existed long before the state took charge of it. And I think we should remember that, uh, that our country has enjoyed a great deal of charitable work which has m alleviated much of the uh, oppression that George rightly refers to. And the question really, in my mind, is to what extent do we go along with this myth that capital, that the, that the right exists to protect capital uh, and that it, the left exists to break it down and redistribute it among those who, who deserve it. And I, I think that this vision is not exactly paranoid, but, it, but that history has moved on since the time when that vision was plausible. It is true, as he says, um, that Thomas Piketty has argued that always there'll be more and more concentration of capital in the hands of the few. But the real question that I would pose is whether that means that there is none in the hands of the many. It all depends upon the quantity of it and the institutions which permit this, the expenditure of it and its distribution. At a certain time in my life, uh, I used to travel around Eastern Europe, which was a then uh, a, a socialist enclave uh, under the control of the Soviet Union. Uh, and um, at the same time, being an academic, I would travel to America too. So I had the opportunity to compare two very different systems, one calling itself socialist, the other called by those who opposed it capitalist. Luckily, Americans don't use these 19th century terms. But um, the thing that was most visible, to me at least, was that not that just that there was much less wealth in Eastern Europe than in America, uh, but also that it was not widely distributed and that the distinctions between those who, who had control of it and those who didn't were largely political. It depended whether you were a member of the, of the party or not, whether you were part of the socialist machine. And if you were not part of the socialist machine, not only were you deprived of property, you certainly weren't able to buy a house or sell things like property in an open market, uh, but you were also deprived of elementary fr freedoms, such as the freedom to say the kind of things I'm saying now. One of the things that I feel that we should, we on the right, should emphasize is that politics is not just about the distribution of wealth. It's not just about the, uh, what um, George has just been telling us about, even though that is terribly important. There are other things that matter too, and these other things were visible then in America, uh, the freedom of people to get a, go about their daily life, the social mobility that enabled you to change class, the, uh, the social mobility that, that uh, George has enjoyed in falling to the state that he is in, and that I've enjoyed in rais rising to mine. <laughs> and these, these, things, these uh, features were not present in, in the socialist countries in those days when socialism really had something going for it. Uh, and, uh, I feel that we ought to look at the, the rest of politics to see exactly what it is, therefore, that the right should be defending. If you're on the left, you tend to have a cause. George is very good with causes, the environmental cause, which he's been, about which I agree with him entirely. Uh, he has a, a causes such as his present one uh, about the distribution of property and the abolition of the rentier class, about which I'm not less enthusiastic. But having causes is very uh, uh, consoling sort of thing. You can say forward. You, this clenched fish, fist salute is always there, ready to go, and people will gather behind you. For me, conservatism can't be concentrated into a slogan in that way. It, is, it isn't a math matter of gathering behind the clenched fist salute. Or if it did, the slogan would be something like, hesitate. You know, uh, which, of course, doesn't na naturally recruit a following. Uh, and I, what I would want to say then, having said that, is let's look around at the actual world, the world that we have, and see what we can love in it, and what we are attached to. 
And surely we should be defending those things and seeing how precious they have been to us. And out of that vision will come another kind of politics, one which is not just obsessed with wealth and its distribution, but which recognizes the great benefits that we've inherited, in particular the benefit of freedom under law, which is something which I think from in many parts of the world just does not exist. The freedom to have a debate like this, uh, the freedom to uh, start up an enterprise of one's own, to think of one's whole life anew and begin again, the autonomy of the individual, the right to own something and to exchange that thing. Okay, people have had difficulties in owning property in this country, but I'm sure most people in this room, those who did not put up their hand about the, to confess that they were renting something, are quite proud to own something and regard it as a freedom because they can exchange it for something else. We should remember that we belong to a civil society defined by shared loyalty. And this makes it possible for us to live under a political process. I, I'm, because of the loyalty that binds us all together as citizens of this country, we can accept to be governed by people whom we hate. I can accept to be governed by George, for instance. I don't hate George, <laughs> but, but were he to be there in Parliament and maybe Prime Minister one day, I would be deeply upset, but nevertheless, <laughs> my view of the matter would be that I'm, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, that I'm under an obligation to obey the law and to, and to uh, live peaceably in, this, in, in, in that jurisdiction. We have a culture that, that uh, affirms these institutions uh, and that, uh, affirms that the importance of civil society over the state. Uh, and we have the freedom to build new institutions from private, uh, private institutions of our own. And this is terribly important in education. Uh, when George spoke about the rentier state, the rentier class, he forgot that there is also the rentier state. There, is a, there are institutions in our society which are more or less uh, absorbed into the state, the education system being one of them, and of course the National Health Service another. And these aren't necessarily the kind of things which I, I think are, the people of this country are well served by. If you look at the universities today, these are centers of privilege in which people are protected largely from the uh, surrounding economic order and from uh, the, uh, any opposition to their own particular standing. And they are dominated by people like George. Luckily, he is not part of a university, just as I am not. But uh, it is the case that, in my case, I'm not part of a university because I could never now go back into one. I have the wrong point of view. Uh, and this, the dominance of the left in those state-controlled institutions is now an immovable part of our society. And I think uh, uh, it's one of the things that we on the right object to. There's a natural tendency on the left to think that your opponent is not wrong, but evil, and therefore you're justified in excluding him from any office. And I think this is something that we've seen growing in recent years. But however, many people on the left share my kind of aspirations too, aspirations towards a free society uh, of creative institutions. Uh, and, um, and I think that that's the kind of left that I would like to see emerging. But it will only emerge if we forget this obsession with property and its distribution and look back at our inheritance and, of the, and the great gift that it is to us that we can uh, enjoy it and, and stand side by side even in, in our disagreements and recognize uh, that we have a shared loyalty. Much of the left today has been fo focused on attacking that loyalty attacking the nation state in favor of some kind of cosmopolitan government, attacking our national culture, including its religious roots in favor of multiculturalism, attacking independent initiatives in education and healthcare and the rest in favor of state supervised uh, uh, initiatives which lead to the perpetuation of the, of the status quo. And there has been this mass hostility on the left to something called neoliberalism, the habit of marketing everything. Now, if there is such a thing as neoliberalism, and that's what it is, I'm against it too. But my own view is that that's not what the right is all about. 
The right is about the, the maintenance of an old-fashioned uh, uh, civil patriotism and the bourgeois way of life that goes with it. Uh, and uh, that's the kind of thing that I think we, that I would like to defend uh, in opposing this motion and saying that uh, indeed the left uh, might think itself to be in the right about everything, but it is just as much in the wrong now as it's always been. Roger Scruton, thank you very much indeed. And as you've all just noticed, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, a Conservative MP for Spelthorne, uh, has just joined us. Welcome, thank you very much for, for being with us. Um, I Just before, uh, since we don't have Stella Creasy and she would have been the next person to speak for the motion, um, I'm, I'm just going to, um, I wonder whether we, yeah, I think we should probably just go to you, Kwasi, and even though it's not the right way round of doing it, I think that's what we're, we're going to do. So. Um, if you've caught your breath. Just about. Good. Would you um, like to go to the podium and I will just um, introduce you again. MP for Spelthorne, of course, uh, has worked as a financial analyst and journalist and historian. And uh, he also has books uh, to add to his uh, success. Um, Ghosts of Empire, Britain's Legacies in the Modern World and Thatcher's Trial, Six Months That Defined a Leader. Kwasi is also going to speak against the motion. Thank you very much for your introduction. I've just... Uh, I, I would just like to say and apologise, obviously, for being late. We've had to vote in the House of Commons against uh, La the Labour Party, against socialists. Um, <laughs> or some of them were socialists anyway. Um, and I have to apologise for not hearing George's uh, speech in its entirety. I've read his columns for 20 years, so I probably imagine uh, I've got a good idea of what he said. Um, <laughs> but I won't try and recapture his spirit or, or try and uh, marshal my arguments against uh, theses that I didn't hear, his arguments that I haven't heard. But what I will do in my short uh, allotted time is uh, recapitulate on some of the things that Roger said. I don't agree, actually, with everything that Roger uh, said. But um, the great thing about being on the right is that we don't have to have uh, universal agreement on everything. There is no um, Ten Commandments or holy text uh, which we have to subscribe to on pain of death. Um, and I know that hasn't quite, the Labour Party under Corbyn hasn't quite reached that point yet. But, uh, but Roger did allude to a uniformity of view, a, a climate of fear almost, uh, that many people on the left uh, feel, uh, particularly today. I mean, you only have to go to universities, as I have done, to see this uh, notion of no platforming. Now, I don't consider myself very old, but I don't remember at university in the 1990s ever hearing of such a phrase as no platforming. And that's the kind of culture that we have uh, today, and I think it's deeply worrying. Uh, and I think it uh, actually just uh, strangles free speech, it inhibits uh, creative discourse, it frustrates debate, and is not the way I think a modern society should be evolving. Now, in terms of socialism, I am going to have uh, two arguments. One, I think, is based on theory. And if you look at what uh, people like Karl Marx, who is the, probably the most widely read uh, thinker of the left, probably certainly the most influential historically, and I think even today, uh, one, of, uh, one of certainly the most influential uh, left-wing thinkers, and look at history, look at examples, and you're not even looking at history, you're looking at the present across uh, the world. You see socialism uh, failing miserably to, um, uh, to deliver. Now, people say, well, the left. What is the left? I think the left is very much something which, as we know, came out of the French Revolution, but its archetypal thinker was Karl Marx. And the problem that Karl Marx had was that all the prophecies that he made about capitalism were wrong. He was a great analytical thinker, and if you read his work in 1867, I think when Capital, uh, the first volume of Capital came out, you would be forgiven for thinking that uh, he'd solved the problem of modernity, he'd solved the problem of industrial society, and that capitalism indeed would uh, collapse under the weight of its own contradictions, and that uh, the capitalist class 
uh, would drive the poor, drive the proletariat to such a pitch of misery that they would rebel and overthrow uh, their, their exploiters. Now that, in 1867, I would say, was not a bad uh, prognosis, not, a, not, a, not a, a senseless prediction. But what happened? What happened was that over uh, the last 150 years, capitalism, and here I do slightly differ with uh, Roger, um, he might call it neoliberalism, but capitalism has liberated millions upon millions of people. Even in the last 20 years, it has lifted something like a billion people out of poverty. It is a complete fallacy for the left to say that uh, more people are miserable and poor today uh, than, than has ever been the case. That's the opposite of the truth. And Karl Marx could never have dreamt of the successes of, uh, of capitalism, broadly speaking. Uh, I would say liberalism. I don't think there's anything neo about it. I think liberalism is a perfectly adequate way of describing the kind of order uh, that I, I seek to describe. Uh, and he was completely wrong. Now, if your central thinker and the central uh, premise of uh, your ideology has got predictions completely wrong, I think you have to question uh, the drift and nature of the ideology uh, he has espoused. Uh, so, in terms of theory, I think he, his theories have been more, uh, broadly disproved uh, by uh, modern practice. And now you look at the actual instances, the examples of socialist uh, left-wing uh, government. You have an appalling 20th century. Uh, I, I'm not going to mention, well, I could mention Stalin. I have mentioned Stalin there, um, but that was a cheap shot. <laughs> I accept that was a cheap jive. But, you know, Stalin was a disciple of Karl Marx. He was someone who described himself as being on the left. And one of the favorites of the modern Conservative Party is to um, go on about Venezuela. Um, and the electorate, frankly, is not interested in Venezuela. And I totally understand why they're not interested in Venezuela. It's a long way away, and most of us have never been there. But it's still an appalling situation in Venezuela. It's got a horrible, uh, pla it's a horrible place to live. The murder rate is probably the highest uh, bar Honduras in the world. It is a society which was the richest uh, country in uh, Latin America, in South America, and it is now a country where people are being killed in order to get some flour or in order to get a bit of petrol. There is appalling lawlessness. And the reason why that country collapsed into the uh, decay that it did was because of socialism. Now, people will say, well, it wasn't proper socialism and it wasn't properly interpreted. But it's a ghastly price for a country to pay. And North Korea is another example. I mean, these are people who ostensibly preach socialism. They're on the left. They're people who uh, subscribe to Marxist ideology. And these appalling instances are not something which I think should be lightly brushed aside. One person, he was not very funny, but it, he made an interesting observation. He said that a socialist government in the Sahara would result in the government trying to import sand within three years. And that's the kind of paradox that socialism uh, can often lead to. And I'm not going to uh, wax as uh, eloquently as Roger did about freedom, uh, ordered freedom, the rule of law, tradition, and all those things. We know where the left stands on these things, and we know that uh, a, a, an extreme left-wing government uh, would destroy uh, much of the world uh, the, or the country uh, that we know. Now, I think that um, I understand the appeal of socialism. I understand in what uh, is a, a, a seemingly a, a chaotic world, um, people wanting certainty and wanting a degree of clarity. But I don't think that socialism, I don't think the left has any answers uh, to provide on that subject. I think the left is an old-fashioned ideology. I'm struck by the fact that many of the people who are its supporters now, prominent politicians, are people who first went into politics in the 1970s. Um, and it seems striking to me when I listen to some of the, I won't mention them, but we know who they are. Um, I feel that I've gone back 40 years um, to the age of two years old. Uh, not that I understood socialism when I was two, but I can imagine that people watching television in 1977 would see many of the same ideas that are being trotted out now, um, expounded uh, uh, then forcefully, I would say even more eloquently 
by people like Tony Benn, um, Michael Meacher, and Michael Foote. Um, we've heard the arguments before, and I think uh, today those arguments are just as invalid and wrong as they were uh, 40 years ago. So the conclusion is the left was never right. That's my conclusion for, for today. <laughs> Quasi Quateng, thank you very much indeed. Uh, still no sign of uh, Stella Creasy. As soon as she does arrive, we will give her the opportunity to speak for the motion. Um, before I open up the questions to the floor, I can, I can now uh, bring you the um, pre-vote. So you all voted when you came in before you'd even heard any of the speakers. And um, we have 37% voting against the motion, 32, 4, and 31, undecided. It's quite a lot of undecideds. That's interesting. Um, so keep those uh, figures in your head. And um, we're going to open up the questions to the floor. There are um, people walking around with microphones. And I'm going to take two or three questions at a time. So uh, usher number one. If you could take the microphone to the first speaker. If you can confine yourself to short questions and not long statements, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I teach, and as a teacher, I have to recognize the worth of, of all my students. And uh, I have to let go of my baggage. And one of the things that both parties have going for them is a lot of baggage. So I'd ask uh, both uh, George and more specifically, uh, Roger, uh, when will the left let go of its baggage around anti-Semitism? And, and Roger, when will the right let go of its homophobia? And when will either party show the moral courage to welcome child refugees into this country? Thank you. Uh, let's have another question before we, we put those points to... Uh, there's a woman here at the front, if we could... Uh, okay, so usher number three, lovely. Um, I'd just like to ask Roger, you mentioned that the um, motto of the Conservatives should be hesitate. Um, does the right therefore exist only to mitigate the left? Thank you very much. And a question down here, I think you've got the microphone. Hello, yes, this is to Mr Monbiot. Um, how would you argue the case of Germany pre the Berlin Wall falling? that surely, if your proposition is correct, it would have been the other way. Everyone would have been fleeing across the wall to East Germany, and we would see it as a great social democracy now, rather than the, well, generally successful, possibly not this week, state that it is. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Roger, would you like to take some, some of those on? So we've got... Um, when will the left, when will the right um, allow for homose the existence of homosexuality? Mm. Let's deal with that one first. And, th and then, does the right only exist to mitigate the left? Yeah. Well, I, I'm one of the, those people who was brought up in the 60s. I, I, I went to Cambridge, um, where my, my principal faults were being lower class, right wing, uh, and heterosexual. I, I had real trouble uh, on those three grounds. Uh, there was no way of getting on in Cambridge society uh, without hiding those defects. So I did. <laughs> so I, I, I got used to the whole culture um, that, that there prevailed, and the whole idea that somehow uh, people like me were homophobic um, came as an enormous shock where, uh, when this ridiculous word got invented. You know, I, I, I said, well, you know, what on earth have I done? And what, uh, what have conservatives like me, like me done? Uh, and particularly, all the right-wing friends that I had at Cambridge were, uh, were you know, straightforwardly gay or, or queer. I mean, in, in all the meanings of that word. And the queerest thing about them was that they were right-wing. <laughs> So, 
uh, I would say that it may be that some people on the right have to reject this, to drop this baggage, but I've never picked it up. Um, <laughs> That, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting personal response, but I wonder if you would take on the issue of, of the party politics of it, because clearly the, well, the, the right does present itself as quite moralistic. It does present yes. itself as, uh, as the, the, an ideology of the, you know, of the, the family and so on. So absolutely. there is that. I, I'm a believer in the family. I also think, believe in the normality of the heterosexual union and the need to, for the sexes to make sacrifices for each other. I do recognise that the legitimation of homosexuality has come about as a necessary historical development and of course people rightly feel that this is a huge change to their family values. I prefer the family values. That is absolutely true but I don't go in, out, around in public um, making a fuss about it. On the thing about whether the, the right exists only to mitigate the left, this is a very good observation. That's absolutely true. We are non-political people who happen to love our political inheritance, nevertheless. And, and we are confronted with all these uh, urgent activists telling us that, uh, that there's something immoral about that, that inheritance and something that we should be ashamed of. So we're forced to defend what actually um, we would prefer people simply not to notice, just like in the family. You know, if you're forced to defend the love that binds you to your wife and children, you will find that your, the whole family order has been upset. It should just exist. George, would you like to respond first to the questions in the audience and then react to, to, to what Roger has said? So let's look at the I thorny like, issue of anti-Semitism in, in, yeah. uh, in What I'd like most is to live in the very simple world that Roger lives in, which <laughs> seems so much cosier than the one that I have to exist in. Um, <laughs> or the one that anyone actually lives in at all. But anyway, um, yeah, anti-Semitism. Look, I've got no truck with this at all. It's absolutely outrageous. I think Ken Livingston should be booted as far as he can be booted. It's absolutely disgraceful. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, anyone who claims to be on the left and is an anti-Semite has got no place on a left that I recognise. Now, I should say that yeah, I'm not a member of the Labour Party. Um, I'm, you know, I believe there are many different lefts. I belong to what I would call the sort of green, democratic, rather woolly left. It's still recognisably left. But, you know, you don't have to toe any particular party line to call yourself, um, a, a, call yourself a left winger. So, obviously, Stella does, because she's in the party. <laughs> Hello, Stella, by the way. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea that um, there should be any such intolerance in a party that calls itself left-wing, you know, it's been blown up a bit out of proportion, but when it's not blown up, when it exists for real, there should be no tolerance whatsoever of anti-Semitism or anything similar to that. Um, on the idea of you know, German, Germany um, uh, pre-war, pre I mean, obviously you're right. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I understand, sorry, pre, pre, pre the collapse of the wall. I mean, you're quite right, of course, and you know, I've got no truck at all with those communist regimes, and no truck with Stalinism. Again, you don't have to, to be on the left. You can be on the left and think that Stalin was one of the worst people ever to blot the face of this planet. And to think that those regimes in Eastern Europe were a, a fright and a terror and a horror to the people who lived under them. But you know, we don't have to be like that. The left which we create in this country can be entirely different to that. And Roger's conceit that it was the right who invented freedom and the left who tried to take it away. I thought, I was the one who's supposed to know nothing about history. Has he forgotten the diggers and the levelers and the chartists and the suffragettes? How many of those would you place on the right? Freedom is something which has been absolutely fundamental to left-wing politics and it's had to be extracted painfully out of the cold, dead hands of those who denied freedom to the great majority because democratic freedom, well, would lead to economic freedom. And this is something that they didn't want to give up at all. And so the whole idea that the Conservative Party exists only, or rather conservative politics, right-wing politics, exists only to, to contain the left and has no politics of its own. It's this innocent victim, this lamb to the slaughter, which simply um, has to try to keep... 
the wolves of socialism at bay, not that I think there's anything right about, uh, r r right about sheep or wrong about wolves. Um, <laughs> um, this is just pure mythology. It's up there with his tea and sympathy and his monarchy and mystification, uh, which is the great sort of mist which the conservatives try to throw around politics so that we don't actually penetrate to the heart of it and see what's really going on. This whole notion that it's the left trying to rip down the nation state while the right is trying to preserve it. Sorry, who are the ones talking about rolling back the state? Who are the ones talking about shrinking the state? Who are the ones like Liam Fox, for example, doing under the table deals with the, with the US corporations in order to undermine parliamentary sovereignty and the legitimacy of the state? These people are not on the left. Sure, the left does some bad stuff. Look, it'd be stupid to deny it. But the idea that the right is this passive mass, just quietly trying to keep things nice and to hold those vicious left-wingers at bay and not do anything on its own account in terms of developing its own politics is pure mythology. I'm keen to take more questions, but as Stella has arrived, I think we should give her the opportunity to speak for the motion. Uh, welcome, Stella Creasy, Labour Thank MP you. for Walthamstow, recently won Backbencher of the Year Award at the 2017 Spectator Parliamentarian of the Year Awards. <laughs> yeah. it, it can only really go downhill from here, really, can't <laughs> it? Um, I should get Speaking up. Speaking for the motion. Thank you. Comrades! <laughs> it's worth a shot, wasn't it? Um, I know it can be hard right now to feel any excitement, any confidence in politics. Truth is, people have never trusted people in my job or, or Quasi's job. I'm sure Quasi, both of Quasi and I were elected in 2010 after the election expenses, but I'm pretty sure that both of us, we go into a pub, someone will say, is that on my tab or my tab to you? But now they fear that even if they could trust you, could you actually do anything at all? It's not just, are you all the same? But is there really any point? Three words to make people feel pessimistic about the future of the world. President Donald Trump. Four words to make you fearful for what role Britain is playing. Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson. Eight words as to why I believe you should commit to the left. We achieve more together than we do alone. That is why I got involved in the Labour movement. Now, for avoidance of doubt, in this current environment, I agree there are many challenges both within my political party. We do have a problem with anti-Semitism. We do have a problem with misogyny. There are also many problems around the world with organisations and countries that claim to be left-wing and are totalitarian. There is nothing left-wing about locking up your opponents. There is nothing left-wing about promoting equality at home and ignoring oppression abroad. But there is also nothing left-wing about going on a protest and having a hashtag. It's what you do that embodies your values. And for me, I became a Labour MP because I believe somewhere in my community in Walthamstow, or God's own country as I like to call it, there, are, there is a young person who could cure cancer if only they had the right opportunities to be able to realise their potential and how that would change all of our lives. And frankly, I'm not being just optimistic. I mean, it's not just that Walthamstow gave you the musical genius of Brian Harvey or the footballing prowess of Harry Kane. We gave you two-ply loo roll in Walthamstow. It was invented, Andrex Road is St Andrews in Walthamstow. <laughs> We also, and I can see there are some children here, but I hope you forgive me, we gave you Durex and rubber gloves with the London Rubber Company. And we trained a young man called Johnny Ives, which if you have an iPad or an iPhone, you'll know he invented both with Apple. So I know when you leave here this evening, something made or invented in Walthamstow may well continue to entertain you. 
But that's the point. Not everybody in this country has that opportunity. Not everybody in the country has the pathway to realize their potential, and then we all miss out. And left-wing politics, for me, is about that simple but powerful principle that we work together to get the best out of each of us for the benefit of us all. And when I look at the balance sheet of what left-wing and right-wing governments have done in this country, I see that case is compelling. I see the contrast between Section 28 and the Equalities Act, between the internal market in healthcare and the NHS, between the Dobbs Amendment and closing our borders to children living in mud in Calais who have the right to be in this country. At every turn, it has been when the left and left-wing people, not necessarily left-wing parties, have stood up for that principle that progress has been made in this country and, crucially, we have all benefited from it. There is a cold, hard economic argument at the heart of this. Equality is good for everyone. Countries that are more equal are more prosperous, more diverse, more resilient. And when we look at the world facing us, never more have we needed the left. A world in which Google, Apple and Facebook have a combined wealth of the same of this country. Major corporations who have more power to change your lives and choose your options than the people you elect. I am here, I am left wing, because I do not believe that people should be a subset of markets as the right do. I believe that people should be masters of their own future and that that true freedom that Kwasi and Roger, I'm no doubt, have told you they want, doesn't come from facing these challenges on your own, but facing them together. That individually, no matter how wealthy you may become, you will only ever make limited choices. But if we pool our resources, if we share our values, if we commit to that principle of equality, then we can transform everyone's life. And that, to me, is truly what being right is. As Nye Bevan once said, never doubt the power of decent folk to want to do the right thing. If there isn't a better example of what being left-wing is, I don't know it. Thank you. Stella Creasy, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's return to questions from the floor. Okay, so we've got the, the usher up there, number four. Thank you. Um, whilst much of George's analysis of history is demonstrably false, there was one particular point that he made that is absolutely relevant and remained unanswered by Roger, and that is the point about wealth inequality. I mean, history does show that Wealth inequality, as it increases, it does destabilise society, sometimes catastrophically. And this is a point that the right have not really adequately addressed, and I'd really appreciate it if Roger and Kwasi could address that point. Thank you. A uh, couple more. Let's go down. Number two. If you just... The lady there, just to your right, who's got her hand up. There. Perfect. Hi. I would like to address the whole panel. Um, I have a son in a comp. He's 16. And he is doing the thing that 16-year-olds do and is challenging the accepted mode of thought. And because he is right-wing, he is being excluded by his friends, he is being judged. I, I don't see the tolerance that you talk about um, being accepted in just the North London schools. It's not just universities. Um, and that's what I used to do at 16, only I was going the opposite way, because that's what you did. <laughs> Thank you very much. And one more, perhaps, there in the middle. A uh, lady with the blonde hair has got her hair. Yeah. Um, Stella, you talked about equality. But um, I think those on the right believe in equality of opportunity. We can't all be equal, but if we all have the opportunity to achieve our potential, isn't, isn't that the right way to go about things, rather than think we're all equal and bring everyone down to that low, lowest common denominator? Thank you very much. Okay, let's, uh, let's turn to the panel now then. Uh, Roger, do you want to take that first one on, on board? The, the, um, the destabilizing to society that wealth inequality yeah. does. I, I think this is a, a very powerful point. I can't um, deny it. And George expressed it very well. 
Um, the argument put forward by Thomas Piketty has had huge influence because, in fact, it's just common sense. You know, you only, yeah, you only invest if the rate of return on capital exceeds uh, the, the, you know, the uh, uh, level of economic growth. So uh, there is, um, there is a, a kind of a priori truth about this. My own view is that it, it's not the, this inequality does not matter as long as institutions are in place which uh, control how that wealth is used uh, and prevent it from being used to set up private sovereignty over the rest of us uh, and ensure that it eventually is spent and passed on. Uh, and in fact, uh, Piketty took the, uh, the um, statistics of uh, all the top people in the Forbes list of, 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 um, of super, super rich people one year uh, and said, you know, the, the wealth is concentrated in their hands and, and is in the next year there's even more wealth concentrated in their hands of the top 10% or whatever it was. But they were completely different people. Uh, and uh, this suggests that after all, the, this wealth is, is going around and around as it should be, creating whatever wealth creates. Wealth in itself, of course, is a static thing. Uh, what, it, what we want is th that wealth to be spent and but to be spent on others. I, it's, it's interesting that you say that it's a strong point. I wonder why then you, you are unable to move on to the next stage, which is to say, well, let's try redistribution. Uh, uh, let's try higher taxes think, in, order, think, to, uh, I, in I, order to... Yes, to, you're to, speaking on behalf of this, the, the gentleman in the audience here. Mm. Um, I would say, yes, of course. Uh, it's no part of being the kind of conservative I am that you should uh, just allow these things to to go on, especially if they're destabilizing. You've got to find a policy to rectify it. I don't think that the massive taxation that uh, Piketty recommends will rectify it. Uh, indeed, it just has led to the, to the um, transfer of the wealth of, of, of France to London. So what would rectify it? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, you've got to have some very strong uh, insistence that, that this wealth cannot be used simply to set up systems of sovereignty. We are, we're seeing that emerging with Facebook, a kind of sovereignty over ordinary people, a control of, of opinion what, what and all that. What does insistence look like, Roger? What, what's that insistence that you're well, talking about? What, uh, I'm, I would say that you, know, you have to have regulations about, about uh, enforcing free freedom of speech on the... On the how does that deal with inequality? Well, it isn't. I'm not saying that inequality in itself is bad. I would want to no, say that it's the, the non-circulation the non of capital Come is on. bad. Yeah, but you just admitted that it is. I mean, you just said wealth inequality is destabilizing. There is a problem with it. The only solution you can come up with is freedom of speech. No, no I, was I don't thinking... see that as being a very effective solution to wealth no. inequality. Mm -hmm. Mar marvelous as it is and important as it is, it doesn't actually address the problem. But it is not wealth inequality which I think is destabilizing. It's the accumulation mm -hmm. in, a, in a small class of people from whom it doesn't move on. Mm -hmm. If that class is itself mobile as it is, then, well, it, then I don't see why it is destabilizing. And, and for your evidence here, you cite the Forbes top 10. Well, yes, sometimes Carlos Slim is below Bill Gates and sometimes mm. Bill Gates is, abo b above Car is below yeah. Carlos Slim. That does not reflect the redistribution of wealth uh, across uh, society. Of course. So Quasi. how would you redistribute well, it let, let Quasi well, come in. He wants to I say think, something. I think the, the issue that people have, uh, certainly in my constituency and I imagine in Stella's as well, is not so much with inequality. They don't like inequality, but the issue they have and they're more uh, obsessed with is fairness. And I think the problem that we've had since the financial crisis is, uh, of 2008 is this idea that people were getting away with it, that they were wrecking uh, and destabilizing a system, and they simply haven't um, paid for their recklessness. I mean, it's striking in Britain, and I'm speaking off piece, I'm not speaking as a, a conservative MP, but it's striking that nobody has actually gone to jail um, throughout this whole process. Um, and people were hugely bailed out uh, they, their recklessness was, was kind of rewarded. And I think the public generally feel that uh, there's a real issue about fairness and people actually being responsible and being held to account for am amassing wealth in, in sometimes nefarious ways. And I think this issue of fairness, this issue of criminal 
liability, this issue of crony capitalism, which hasn't featured in, in this debate. I think that's a very live issue, and I think people on the right, people who broadly support uh, a, a, a liberal economy, as I would describe it, need to focus on crony capitalism. We need to not bail out every uh, financial institution uh, at the drop of a hat. We need to look and tighten up uh, criminal law when people are, are defrauding uh, the system. We need to actually look at um, tax evasion, and I think the government, I sound like a, a government MP, but the government actually has done quite a bit on, on the issues uh, regarding uh, tax evasion. So I think there's definitely a point about fairness and, and about the idea of people getting away with it. But what I don't uh, like, and I think Stella put the case very well, but she came up with this phrase, equality is good for everyone. I honestly thought that was from Animal Farm or something. I mean, it, it literally, I mean, it sounds like it's come straight out of an Orwellian uh, novel. And, and, and I, I think one of the uh, people in the panel, in the, in the audience, made the very good point. We want equality of opportunity, but you're never going to get absolute equality of outcome. And I suggest the world in which you did get that would be a pretty gray, boring, and intolerant place. And I think that uh, you know, we, you've got to consider that as part of your, as part of your response. Stella. So, <laughs> it's fun being lectured by Quasi today when we've been in the chamber today debating exactly these issues. I Me wasn't taking to say on anything. the crony capitalists in the PFI companies <laughs> who are bleeding dry our schools and hospitals, and Quasi and his government defending the £190 million in windfall profits that they've made from your schools and hospitals. Uh, me standing up for the importance of gender impact assessments so that we can understand the impact of government policy in tackling discrimination in our society. Government MPs saying that that's all to do with experts and academics and we don't want them involved in our political process. I think what we need here is better definitions of what we mean by equality and what it represents. So, uh, Madam, for me, what the case for equality represents is about lost potential. So actually the reason why it matters to have data, the reason why it matters to have a definition of what a more equal society looks like is then you can test whether you're reaching it. I, I have to say, Roger, if you lived in my part of the world, if you saw some of the challenges that some of the poorest people in our society are dealing with, you wouldn't say that inequality doesn't matter. It absolutely matters. And the reason... The reason that it matters for all of us and the reason why we do benefit when we strive for a more equal society and therefore strive not just for a general sense of equality of opportunity but actually look at the outcomes and ask are we reaching it is because when I talk about the talent in my community it is still the exception rather than the rule that it will be realised. So we are still missing out on those future cancer surgeons, those future inventors, those future musicians that could come from areas of our country where inequality is ingrained. The flip side of that is what Roger's talking about in terms of people with high levels of wealth, and for me that's a question of accountability. And it's accountability for the fact that we all benefit when we make progress, so it is right that all of us make a contribution to making, forward, making that happen. And what we see with the PFI companies, with crony capitalism, is organisations not pulling their weight and then asking people in the poorest communities of our society to do a double shift. That is why the right will always fail you, because it will ask the market to figure that question out, rather than asking people and asking whether people have the power to achieve their potential. Madam, you talk about tolerance, you're absolutely right. It is not left wing to deny debate. The best policies, the best answers, the best solutions come from debate and discourse. Whenever I hear Kwasi and his friends talking in Parliament, I know the ideas are better on the left. But ha hang on just one second, Silla. You didn't really respond to what the, the, the lady with the 16-year-old was sorry, saying. No, she's, so, so you know, she's, she's, talking, she's talking very much what, about a culture. Ap apolo apologies. Right? Well, in which case, then, I, I, that totalitarianism, that idea that debate is somehow a bad thing, that, um, yes, if you disagree with somebody, you are either a red Tory or a Corbynista or, goodness, God forbid, a Tory MP, is wrong. I... I want to win arguments by the power of the ideas that I stand for, by the values that have driven me in politics. I don't want to win them by intimidating people or excluding people. So I'm genuinely sorry that's happening to your son. If you live in Walthamstow, I would be happy to follow that up with the school, because it is wrong. 
Because actually for your son to be able to debate ideas just as you did, that's how, why diversity matters. You don't get that if you look for general equality of opportunity. You don't understand how diversity improves everybody's lives because you don't get the, the cut and flow of the debate. Like I, 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 say, I wonder if I can just put the same question to George then, because it came up when Roger was talking about uh, the dominance of the left in institutions and how in, at university level, and, and the, the, the woman there talking about her son at school, saying that, you know, we're talking about a cultural issue where the, the left is showing itself to be intolerant. I wonder if you can just address that. Well, look, again, I've got no truck with intolerance at all, and I think it's absolutely essential that um, we have um, debate everywhere and as wide as possible. But actually, I wrote down what Roger said about universities. There's, there's students there, he said the people in the university are protected from economic forces. Try telling that to students with £40,000 of debt. What we, what we see happening at universities and indeed at schools is the penetration of this whole market business ethos, neoliberalism, the word they don't like to use and don't like to hear, but the penetration of that ethos into these institutions, which then actually greatly inhibits people's freedom. It inhibits your freedom to play, to explore, to develop ideas because you've got this debt ticking away in the background all the time, clocking up, clocking up. So you have to keep your head down, make sure you get a job which is going to pay a lot of money when you get out, otherwise that debt's just going to be looming behind you all the time. Now this, I would say, is a great inhibitor of freedom. It's a great inhibitor of that experimental nature that should be at the heart of all education because you're just being processed into the machine by this crazy policy of lumbering young people with these hideous levels of debt. Now, that's a right-wing policy. That's not a left-wing policy. And that's something which, if young people are to have any chance of a decent life and bright prospects, we have to get rid of, and straight away. Thank you very much. We're, we're, we're going to we're gonna have to just... Um, pause for a moment because we would like the vote uh, to take place again now. So if you could use your slips to make a decision. So I'm going to invite the speakers up now to sum up their speeches, two minutes each. Um, and I'm not sure which order we go in now because we, we start with, well, we start, we start with Stella. We've talked a bit this evening, and I apologize for being late, about equality. Equality needs to be broken down into what do we actually mean. So yes, it means an equal say. It means democracy. But it also means equal access. And in one of the things that we know is dividing our country right now is the difference between access to the bank of mum and dad. That isn't about going to university. That's about some very basic things, about children being able to eat, to have a roof above their head, to be able to deal with the differences that happen in life. One of the things that being an egalitarian, being left-wing is about, is recognizing how we will solve those challenges. We are unlikely to be able to solve them on our own, and therefore we will always end up paying the price for that failure, what the right would call market failure, for the people who do not achieve their potential, who are not able to contribute to society, who are not able to be in a room with you and inspire you on to achieve great things too. Genuinely, we achieve more together than we do alone. And whether that is a slogan that you might put on a march or a hashtag, it's certainly a way of life that I have found and seen in my lifetime to have changed this country for the better. I'm yet to see the same force for good on the right. The left is not perfect. The left has many challenges. But as one of my predecessors, Clem Attlee, used to say, the left is what its members make it. So I hope tonight you will join the call to make Britain a better place. Stella Creasy, thank you very much. Kwasi Kwarteng. So I'd like to start my concluding remarks by telling an anecdote. A friend of mine who is about to have a baby and is a momentum activist uh, asked me what I was up to this week. And I said I would be having a debate about the left and the right. And she said, who are the other speakers? And I said, she's a momentum activist. She spent the whole of the last summer trying to get uh, labor and momentum uh, going in the election. And I said, Stella Creasy is my opponent. She said, Stella Creasy, she's not left wing. And, <laughs> and listening to her, listening to her, I agreed with lots of what she said. Of course, 
I want people in her constituency, just as I want people in Spellthorn to have the op massive opportunities. I completely agree with her when she says that there are too many people in this country who have the talent, but are not being allowed to develop that talent through lack of opportunities. And that's exactly why I went into politics, and I think that the right, rather than the left, has a much more uh, a robust approach about trying to unlock talent um, than the left. I mean, take one example in terms of selective education. Stella, I know, benefited from a highly selective school in Colchester. As, as many, as, as many, and, and, and my, my guilty secret is that I was at college with your brother. I was at college with your brother at wow. university and he went to the boys' equivalent, and that's a great school. And yet people on the left, maybe not Stella, but people on the left who've benefited from selective education have consistently denied it to lots and lots of people who would have benefited from it, who would have benefited from it. And, and so that was just one example. That is just one example of the way I think the left actually deny and frustrate talent in a way that I think the people on the right um, can, can actually try and solve those sort of problems. I'm not saying the right is perfect. I think Stella's absolutely right. There are, there are lots of blame, there's lots of inadequacy on both sides. But I think the general broad approach is much better on the right on these issues. And I'm delighted actually that, that Stella, um, Stella is, uh, came tonight. The other thing I would say, just in my closing remarks, I, she said, uh, so who's the other chap? Uh, who's, she assumed it was a man, I don't know why. Um, but she, maybe she had um, pre-knowledge. Um, and she said, and I said, oh, George Monbiot. And, and she said, ah, he's one of us. He's a real lefty. Um, <laughs> so that was the, so that was the and, and I think on, on, I didn't hear what George said, but I've heard his uh, intermittent remarks. And I think her assessment was probably right. So <laughs> I'll leave it there. Roger Scruton, to you. Yes, um, well, Stella said something quite important when she said that the, the left is what its members make it. And this is her message of hope uh, and kind of triumphalist message. Uh, I think the same is true of the right. The right is what its members make it. Uh, and they make it in a different way. What I was trying to say was that we don't actually make it through these movements like momentum and so on. We're not the, the fist-clenching type. We do nevertheless make it through civil association, through our belief in and love for the, the country that is ours, and our desire to protect the freedoms that have grown in it. And of course, there are all kinds of things wrong with it. Human beings are imperfect, but what we most of all need is the institutions that enable us to correct our faults. That's what we're talking about now. How do we correct those faults as they arise? We don't do it by imposing some uniform egalitarian socialist system from on high. We do it by creating the opportunities for people to come out and express their talents and also to associate with each other in a legal and a law-abiding and peaceable way. And that's what we've enjoyed in this country. And not everybody, in fact, very few countries in the world have enjoyed it, certainly not in previous centuries. Uh, Estella is quite uh, right in emphasizing the idea of equality as fundamental to the left-wing vision. But I, I think there's a tendency to confuse uh, equality, uh, the pursuit of equality, with the pursuit of wealth. Uh, that's to say, to the elimination of poverty. It, I live in a, a very poor community, a community of small farmers who, uh, who have 40 or 50 acres each, who are essentially in a, at a subsistence level. Um, and they are all equal in the sense that they haven't, uh, their assets are very small. But nevertheless, thanks to our country and, and the people around them, all kinds of opportunities are constantly arising, and many people take them, younger people take them. They take them by moving away from the farm, by, by turning their farm into something like a, a semi-legal haulage business, and so on. Those are the kind of things that, that we, we actually... Uh, that is the way that the rural economy works. The, it's, a, it's a black economy because, of course, uh, the, the government has always stepped on it. And I, I think that this is something that we have to remember. I'm a grammar school boy, uh, um, like Stella. I didn't have the, the those... <laughs> I didn't have those privileges. Well, I'm taking the author, um, quasi is my authority for this. Uh, but, um, 
I, I was lucky. I, esca I, es I escaped from a poor background. Uh, I was given all the opportunities that enabled me to get to Cambridge and become a university professor, later to go around these posh public schools giving lectures to boys like Kwasi, who were... <laughs> who emerged, actually when I first met him, emerged from the throng with a copy of my book on Kant and asked me to sign it. And I thought, this man's going to go somewhere. He <laughs> <laughs> and he did. But the, 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 the fact is we have in this country have enjoyed many of these, these opportunities and we've, all, all of us, left and right, have wanted an equality of opportunity. It's just that we disagree about the means to obtaining it. We, on the right, think you obtain it through the, the long process of civil association, whereby people accommodate to each other uh, and overcome their problems in their uh, local communities and their little platoons. Those on the left think you've got to have a, a statewide system in order to rectify the embedded injustices that we've inherited, which George gave us such a, a, a a um, poetic account of at the beginning. So uh, I think that by and large I would say the right, like the left, is what its members make it and we've made it something durable and good. Roger Scruton, thank you very much. And the last speaker, George Monbiot, please, uh, just to sum up for the motion. Sure. I, I should point out on Stella's behalf that she's neither grammar school nor a boy, just to clarify <laughs> that, um, that slightly inaccurate summary there. Um, I think the, the key to this whole debate is the term social mobility, because I think it's the one thing we all agree on. We all agree that social mobility is a good thing. In fact, Roger and Quasi have talked about hardly anything else. Fine. We all agree that it's a good thing, which causes a real problem for them because all the data shows that in conditions of high inequality, you have very low social mobility. And the greater the concentration of wealth by the rich people in society, the lower social mobility becomes. When you have a distributive economy, when you have high taxation on wealth, um, when you have um, high spending on public services, um, high spending by the state, in other words, social mobility soars. The data is rock solid on this. So if you want social mobility, which we all want, you should be on the left. And I welcome these two new converts. <laughs> and I think for me, you know, the, the crucial moment was, you know, when Roger admitted that inequality was a bad thing because of its destabilizing nature, but then the only solution he could propose to that from the right was freedom of speech. And much as we all agree that freedom of speech is a wonderful and necessary and essential thing and can and should be supported by all sides of a political debate, let me explain to you, it is not going to solve inequality. Not by itself. You need government action. You need taxation. You need public spending. You need social mobility. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what the left offers and why it has right on its side. Thank you. George Monbiot, thank you very much indeed. So we have the result of the vote. Just to remind you, before the debate, you all voted as you came in. Uh, a reminder that the, the motion tonight was the left has right on its side. Before the debate, 37% voted against, 32% voted for, and 31% were undecided. And you've just voted again after having heard all four speakers. 57% voted against, 36% voted for, 6% undecided. And it was an 8% swing vote. It only remains now for me to say thank you to all the speakers, Stella Creasy, George Monbiot, Kwasi Kwarteng, and Roger Scruton. I'd also like to thank Intelligence Squared and all of you for taking part and being here tonight. Thanks very much for coming.